Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. In this lecture, I'd like to uh, uh, work through the uh, Michelson Morley experiment. This is possibly the most famous null experiment in the history of science. Um, you often read about it. Uh, very often the textbooks don't go into any great detail about how the experiment was done. They just uh, focus on the uh, final answer. Um, I like to uh, deviate from that plan a little bit because I like to discuss the experiment, try to get, uh, try to convince you that it, uh, uh, how it worked and, and, uh, you know, it's, it was very clever, very clever piece of e equipment that was developed in order to, uh, check out this, uh, uh, motion of light with respect to this, uh, ether frame of reference. So I'd like to build a little intuition before we launch into Michelson Morley by, uh, considering a much simpler, uh, experiment that, um, basically embodies all the uh, essential features of the Michelson-Morley experiment. And uh, I'd like you to think about uh, uh, two swimmers, right? Uh, the swimmers are going to swim uh, in a river. Uh, the river is precisely 100 feet wide. And these two swimmers have practiced for uh, months to be able to swim at a constant speed of 5 feet per second. So somehow they've synchronized their motions so that uh, swimmer, the red swimmer here can swim at five feet per second. The uh, orange swimmer down here can also swim at five feet per second. Now the river that they're going to swim in has a drift velocity of about three feet per second. So the water is moving at three feet per second through the river and these two guys are going to swim a hundred feet and we're going to time how long it takes them to, to go from their start point to 100 feet out and then back again, right? So the red swimmer is going to swim upstream and then back by precisely 100 feet. The yellow swimmer is going to swim across the, uh, the river and back, right? Which is, again, 100 feet wide. Um, if the drift velocity of the river were zero, uh, the time it would take for the swimmer to go out 100 feet and back again would be precisely the same as the time it would take for this swimmer to cross the river and swim back again. So that's for zero drift velocity. As you turn on the drift velocity though, it's going to take, actually it's going to take longer for this swimmer to complete 100 feet compared to uh, this swimmer. And uh, the reason is sketched out in these boxes. Right? So, um, the idea is pretty simple. Uh, uh, the red swimmer is going to be going at five feet per second. There's going to be a drift velocity of three feet per second. So as he swims out, he's going to be uh, moving at eight feet per second. Uh, the time it's going to take him to cover a hundred feet is going to be about twelve and a half seconds. On the back, on the return trip, right, his, his, his constant five foot per second uh, swimming speed is going to be counteracted by the three feet per second uh, speed or drift velocity of the river, right? So his net velocity coming back is only going to be at two feet per second. And so to cover the 100 feet swimming back, he's going to require 50 seconds. So his total transit time is going to be the sum of these two numbers, which is about 62 and a half seconds. Now that should be compared uh, to the yellow swimmer who has to swim across the river and back. Uh, the yellow swimmer thinks about it a little bit and realizes that if he swims uh, at a, a, along a line perpendicular to the river bank, this drift velocity is going to push him way off course. And so he does a simple calculation and realizes that he has to swim at an angle of about 37 degrees. And if he swims at this angle of 37 degrees, uh, at five feet per second, when combined with this drift velocity of three feet per second, he'll end up just swimming a trajectory that's indicated by this yellow line. And so I work out the, uh, the arithmetic here, right? It turns out that his 
speed across the river and the speed back are going to be exactly the same. They work out to be 25 seconds each way. So his total transit time is going to be 50 seconds. And so he is going to swim uh, the same distance uh, that the red swimmer swims, but he's going to do it in about 12 and a half seconds less. So this is the key. This, if you understand this example, then, you, then I think you can appreciate um, the logic behind the Michelson-Morley experiment, because what they're going to do is they're going to launch a light wave. They're going to split this light wave into two uh, paths. One path is going to be directed parallel to a drift velocity of the ether. The other light path is going to be directed uh, at an angle perpendicular to the drift velocity of the ether. And they're going to try to measure in a very clever way the time difference that it takes for this light beam to travel through uh, uh, a, a different length of, of distance. So um, what this, um, this simple example about swimming proves, it proves that, uh, first of all, if the velocity of the river were zero, uh, then both swimmers would record the same time. And more importantly, by measuring the time difference between the two swimmers, you can actually work backwards. Right? You can actually work backwards and you can figure out the velocity uh, of the river, which means how fast the river is drifting and in what direction it might be drifting in. Right? And uh, so these simple ideas based on uh, swimming in a river turn out to apply uh, in a very nice way to measuring the velocity of the ether with respect to Earth. And the only thing that you have to do is you have to very precisely measure uh, the speed of light as the light moves in different directions through this, um, this so-called ether that, that's supposed to permeate all space. So there were two sets of experiments done. The first set of experiments were done by Michelson in 1881. Uh, Michelson revised the uh, experimental apparatus and performed a much more accurate measurement uh, and he, uh, Morley uh, joined him as a collaborator, so it's known as the Michelson-Morley experiment. That was done in 1887. And the idea is, 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 is very similar to the idea of swimming in the river, uh, right? Here we have the Earth. The Earth orbits around the Sun, and as the Earth orbits around the Sun, its velocity with respect to, let's say, an ether that might be stationary with respect to the Sun, right? its velocity is going to rotate in different directions. And so if, if the ether is stationary with respect to uh, uh, the, the sun, then uh, the Earth will provide a velocity through that ether. And uh, if the Galilean transform of velocities is applicable, you should measure different speeds for light, depending on whether the light moves parallel to this drift uh, velocity of the Earth, or whether light moves perpendicular to this drift velocity of the Earth. And so how are you going to measure those time differences, right? Well, you're going to set up some sort of a mirror that reflects a light beam and directs it back to its origin. And one mirror is going to be oriented so that it's parallel to the uh, motion of the Earth's velocity. Another light beam is going to be, uh, uh, another mirror is going to be oriented so that the motion of the light is perpendicular to the uh, uh, drift velocity of the Earth. Uh, the other thing I will say is that uh, the, the velocity of the Earth re with respect to the speed of light is really small, right? So it's much, much less than one. The ratio of the velocity of the Earth to the speed of light is about 10 to the minus four. And so that means that you're gonna need a very precise uh, measurement of time intervals if you're going to pull this experiment off. If, um, you know, if, if the, um, this ether is drifting with respect to the sun, we can use the same arguments that we did before. Okay, the only difference is we have to find a, a net vector uh, velocity, right? So for different points of the Earth's orbit around the sun, the velocity vector of the Earth is going to be oriented a different, in a different direction with respect to, let's say, a drift velocity of the ether. And so you have to do a vector addition of the Earth's velocity 
and the ether's velocity in order to get a net velocity out. The, the, the bottom line is that this net velocity, right, is going to change its magnitude and orientation with respect to the Earth's motion around the sun. And so if you want to uh, identify light paths which are parallel and perpendicular, right, to these net velocity uh, 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 components, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to build a piece of equipment that is free to rotate because you're going to have to rotate that piece of equipment until it's lined up with the net velocity and the net velocity is going to change depending on where the earth is around the sun. So that puts a, an important constraint on, uh, on the design of a piece of equipment that, uh, uh, that might be able to measure these very small time differences. So the, um, the apparatus that was used in 1887, there's, there's actually a very famous picture of it that you'll find on many different websites. This is a schematic diagram of, of, of what the uh, apparatus does. It's just a large slab of uh, concrete, and on this slab of concrete are partially silvered mirrors, uh, totally reflecting mirrors, a light source, and a viewing screen. And the basic idea is um, that light source is up here, right? Uh, it's going to send a beam of light, and that beam of light is going to reflect back and forth on mirrors that are positioned. Uh, that light beam initially is going to um, uh, be split by a partially silvered mirror. So there'll be a second light beam that travels back and forth in a direction perpendicular to the first. These two light beams then recombine and um, and, uh, and are observed on a, uh, on a screen uh, with a viewing telescope. So here's the viewing telescope, here's the viewing screen, right? And what you're going to look for is you're going to actually look for interference patterns between the light that goes this way and the light that goes that way. And I like to try to explain that in a little bit more detail in, in, this, in this lecture. So, this is a simpler diagram that you can uh, understand. Um, um, it's, a, it's a bit more schematic than the uh, diagram on the previous slide. This is the input light beam, which we assume to be monochromatic, so we assume it has one wavelength. There's a beam splitter. This is a partially silvered mirror. This beam splitter splits the light. Some of it goes this way, some of it goes that way. Right? There are two mirrors we call mirror M1, we call mirror M2, right? Uh, the length of the interferometer, uh, uh, to, from the partially silvered uh, mirror to, uh, to the reflecting mirror M1, that distance is L1. The distance from the partially silvered mirror to mirror M2 is distance L2. Uh, certain intensity of light I1 moves in this arm of the interferometer. A different intensity of light, I2, moves in this arm of the interferometer. And after these two light beams bounce off the mirror and uh, uh, reflect, they're recombined uh, at this point, and this then forms the output of the, of the mirror, uh, output of the interferometer. So this is the signal that we're going to measure. This signal is going to show up as an interference pattern between the light that goes this way and the light that goes that way. And that interference pattern is going to shift its position on the screen if there's a difference in the to transit time this way compared to the transit time that way. So the other key feature of this is that there's some net uh, drift velocity of the ether, right? So for the sake of argument, I align that net drift velocity with beam I1 to begin with. And what I'm going to be interested in doing is I'm going to be interested in measuring the shift in this interference pattern as this entire apparatus is rotated uh, uh, um, uh, in, a, in a very precise way. And so uh, in principle, what I'm interested in is uh, I'm interested in uh, making measurements as a function of rotation angle of the apparatus. Right? There's two conditions that I'm most interested in. One condition is, is referred to as the 90 degree angle. That's when uh, the uh, beam I2 is parallel to the net drift velocity of this so-called uh, ether. 
And the other uh, orientation I'm interested in is when this arm of the interferometer that I call I1 is parallel to the uh, net drift velocity of this ether. So, uh, and what follows, I'm just going to focus on these two angles, theta equals zero and theta equals 90 degrees. Uh, these, turns out these two orientations would produce extremes in the time delay uh, uh, of, of these two beams, I1 with respect to I2. And the other important fa factor is that the uh, analysis does not require us uh, to uh, make L1 equal to L2, right? L1 and L2 can be close to one another. Uh, the difference in L1 and L2 does not come into the analysis. It's only the sum. So we don't have to have a very precise measurement for both L1 and L2. So what I do is I work out the arithmetic and for the two cases. Uh, the first case I work out is for the Galilean velocity uh, addition when theta is equal to zero. When theta is equal to zero, the light beam is parallel to this um, light path, uh, which has a length L1. In all cases, the red arrows indicate the trajectory of the light beam. And I'm just interested in calculating how long it takes for the light beam to go up and back uh, through this distance L1. And we're going to do that calculation using this Galilean velocity addition formulas. The situation is exactly analogous to um, uh, the swimmer who swam along the drift current of the river, swam up and back along the drift current of the river. In one case, when he's swimming up, uh, the drift, uh, drift velocity adds to his velocity. So here, uh, the net drift of the ether would add to the velocity of light C. On a return trip, uh, the net drift of the, of the ether would subtract from the velocity of light C. Right? So this would be the time interval T1 that it would take this beam to go up and back. Uh, the time interval T2 for the light beam to travel at right angles uh, uh, to, the, to the net drift velocity right, is calculated down here. In this case, the, uh, uh, the time interval to get from the beam splitter to mirror M2 and then back to the beam splitter, that time interval is exactly the same, right? Again, it's just uh, directly analogous to the, uh, to the uh, example of the swimmer in the river. Uh, we're interested in the time difference between the path length that, that's parallel uh, to the drift velocity and the path length that's perpendicular to the drift velocity. So I just have to take the difference between those two numbers that I calculated on the previous slide. There's a few equations, uh, a few lines of algebra, and I find out what the time difference is when that apparatus is oriented at theta equal to zero. And I give this, this, uh, this is, this is what I call equation one, and I, I put it in red. Now what I do is I rotate the entire apparatus through 90 degrees. And I want to see what the time difference is uh, between uh, the light beam that travels parallel to the net velocity, uh, uh, net drift velocity of the ether. And I want to compare that to the time interval that it takes uh, for a light beam uh, when it's uh, moving perpendicular to the, this net drift velocity. Uh, so what you'll notice is here now my mirrors are interchanged. This used to be mirror M1, but since I rotated it through 90 degrees, this becomes mirror M2. This becomes mirror M1. This now becomes the path length L1. This now becomes the path length L2. So the algebra is exactly the same as on the previous slides. I, I calculate the new transit time uh, to move parallel to the net uh, velocity of the ether. I calculate the transit time for the light beam to move perpendicular uh, to the uh, uh, net drift velocity of the ether. And again, I'm interested in the time interval, the difference, time difference between these two paths. So I calculate that here, and I get an expression which I call equation two, and I write that in blue, right? And so equation two is different than equation one. There, there should be a net difference in this time between the theta equals zero orientation, theta equals 90 degree orientation. What would that time difference be? That time shift between the theta equals zero 
and theta equals 90 degree case? Well, I just have to subtract equation one, which is red, from equation two, which is blue. And when I do that, some terms cancel out. And at the end of the day, after a few lines of algebra, you can show that that time, that time interval, uh, that time shift difference between the two orientations of theta equals zero and theta 90 degrees that is going to be just given by this expression here. It involves the, the, the sum of the length of the two interferometer arms, and it involves the ratio of, of V net squared over C squared, right? And so by measuring, the point is by measuring this time difference, right, uh, and, and knowing something about L1 and L2, I can infer what this net drift velocity is, right? That's the important uh, takeaway message here. So um, you can work out the math, um, right? It turns out that uh, the, that time interval delta t is going to show up in the argument of a cosine, right? And it's going to shift uh, uh, these fringes that are going to be observed uh, by an amount given by c times delta t. Delta t is that time shift between theta equals 0 and theta equals 90 degrees. So we can use this expression for delta t and the argument of this cosine function, and we end up <clears throat> with a, a shift in the output that's going to be proportional to v net squared over c squared. Right? It also is going to depend on the ratio of L1 plus L2 divided by the wavelength of the light. Okay? What that all means, right, at the end of the day, what that all means is that if you look at the fringe pattern uh, through a telescope that, that, that's produced by these two light beams that travel through different paths, right? There's going to be a shift in the net fringe pattern uh, between, let's say, the theta equals zero orientation and the theta equals 90 degree orientation. And I just put in some numbers up here to convince you that that shift is going to be about 20% of the, of the fringe spacing. That's what they were expecting. Uh, when they when they did this experiment, so they they were expecting a, a, a small but noticeable shift that could be easily measured when you view these fringe patterns uh, through a telescope. So what I've done in the in the next few slides is I've I've I've, I've made available a, a, a computer simulation. You can run it uh, yourself on on the web by going to this website. Uh, this just tries to illustrate the, the basic idea that I, I worked through the arithmetic on. Uh, this is the Michelson-Morley experiment. Here's a source of light. Uh, the source of light is going to strike this partially silvered mirror. It's going to be split into two beams. Those two beams are going to travel, uh, recombine, and then strike a detector. Uh, all the while those light beams are moving, there's going to be this so-called ether drift. Right, uh, the ether drift is represented by these little yellow arrows that are oriented in some direction in space, right? And what we can do is we can rotate this entire apparatus with respect to this drift velocity, and we can time, right? We can time the difference uh, between light to go up and back, uh, between light to go this way and 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 return, and and so the time clock uh, for this experiment is going to be given up here. And we can also change the orientation of this equipment by rotating it using this knob down here. So I just wanted to run this simulation so you get a sense of what's, what's really going on. Um, so I think if I click it, right, what happens is the light beam is launched, right? When it gets to this mirror, it splits. Uh, when it splits, it, it's designated as red and green, so you can keep track of the two separate light beams. The two light beams recombine. They're going to strike a detector. All the while, our clock up here is measuring transit times, right? And uh, if you run this uh, carefully, what you'll find is that uh, the green actually hit the screen before the red, right? So the green was first, the red was second. And this is for uh, orientation of uh, zero degrees. In the next slide, we rotate the um, orientation. So now we've got the orientation at 90 degrees, right? Our source is now up here, so our source rotated through 90. 
our detector rotated through 90, right? So now we're going to launch a beam from up here, and we're going to uh, 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 calculate the, the uh, simulate the time delay, All right? So, so here's our light beam. It's moving. It strikes the detector. It splits into two beams. One is red. One is green. They reflect from the reflecting mirrors. They recombine, and they strike the detector. So now what we find is we find the red beats the green, where in the other case, the green beat the red. So there's a time, there's a time difference between these two uh, orientations. Theta equals zero, theta equals 90 degrees. If you go to this website and you run the simulation at 45 degrees, you'll find that this drift velocity affects both arms of the interferometer exactly the same. So in that orientation, there is no, uh, no difference in the drift velocity between these two beams. So that's a, a, a very simple um, uh, summary of the Michelson-Morley experiment. Of course, when they did this experiment, they didn't know what the direction of this drift velocity was. So they had to repeat the measurement for uh, closely spaced intervals of, of rotation of this equipment, right? And uh, they were convinced, rightly so, that uh, for one of these orientations of the table, they would achieve this parallel orientation with the drift velocity. And once they achieve that parallel orientation with the, with the drift velocity, then when they rotated the table an additional 90 degrees, uh, they would see the, the, the appropriate shift in fringes that resulted. Uh, the interesting thing is when they did the experiment, they didn't see any effect, right? They, no matter what orientation this, this, this interferometer was, was uh, positioned in, no matter what time of the year, what direction the uh, Earth was moving around the sun, they saw absolutely no shift in the uh, interferometer pattern. And um, that led them to conclude, rather surprisingly, that the speed of light uh, was constant, independent of its orientation with respect to this so-called ether drift, right? And that was a very surprising result because, uh, again, this Galilean transform had been around for something like 300 years. Uh, it made so much sense that uh, it wasn't even questioned. Uh, yet this very simple experiment uh, uh, proved that uh, the velocity of light was independent of its uh, motion with respect to even this, this so-called ether. So, uh, you know, what do you do? Well, uh, lots of people uh, came up with different hypotheses. One idea was that maybe the, the ether is being dragged by the Earth, and so uh, the ether around the Earth's surface is stationary, right? All kinds of crazy ideas were put forward to explain the result. Uh, one guy thought about the experiment differently. That was Einstein. He concluded that uh, there was no absolute reference frame and that uh, the speed of light was constant, independent of the reference frame. And this is rather surprising because it means that independent of your motion with respect to the speed of light, you'll always measure the same value. And uh, he started at that point and uh, uh, re-derived the Galilean transformations. Uh, the new transformations are referred to as the Einstein-Lorentz uh, transformation equations. And that is going to be the subject of our next lecture. So. Uh, We've uh, spent some time trying to set up the background. Hopefully it gives you a little bit better understanding of the uh, uh, rationale that drove these experiments. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, because the speed of light is constant, independent of uh, reference frame motion, uh, the Galilean transformation has to be thrown out. A new transformation has to be introduced. And that new transformation is going to mix up distance and time uh, in a way that uh, is, uh, uh, was completely uh, 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 unexpected at the, at the time it was introduced. So please come back and listen to the next lecture, and we'll, we'll discuss uh, uh, the Einstein-Lorentz transformation equations. Thanks a lot.